On the day it all started, nothing was out of the ordinary. On days when significant things begin, nothing ever is. It was a Thursday morning in New Orleans. Inside of their business, Joseph and Catherine Maggio had closed up shop the previous evening and prepared to open their bar and grocery the following morning. They were a hard-working couple and ran a successful New Orleans bar room and grocery out of their home on the corner of Upper Line and Magnolia Streets. As the evening drew to a close, they took time to clean up and to prepare for the next day's business before turning in for the night. The decision to go to bed was, perhaps, one of the easier decisions of the evening. But unfortunately, it would also prove to be the most fatal. At around two in the morning, as the couple slept, a stranger entered their home. He had come in silently from the kitchen door and crept along the hallway in perfect silence in the dark, completely hidden by the darkness of night. From the shadows he kept his eye on the bedroom where the Maggio slept soundly, unaware of any present danger. He slid the axe he was carrying into the ready position. The Maggios likely never woke up. About two hours after these events, at four o'clock in the morning, Andrew Maggio, Joseph's brother, who lived in the adjoining apartment, was sleeping off a drunken night. World War I was looming on everybody's minds, and some time before he had received his draft card in the mail. This was not news he wanted to hear, and it was nearing his time to report to the Navy. This evening he had been out living it up with friends while he still could. After tonight's business he was extremely intoxicated, and was feeling all of the effects of it. So when his brother Jake entered his room and tried to shake him awake, this was the last thing in the world Andrew cared to experience. Jake called his name a few times and kept shaking him with ever-increasing vigor trying to wake him up until at last, to Andrew's dismay, it worked. Jake told him that for some time he had been hearing persistent groans coming through the wall he shared with his brother and sister-in-law. He had knocked on the wall a few times, thinking that they might be having a bit of... fun but it didn't do anything to stop the sound. Maybe something happened, he thought. They might need help of some kind. So, feeling sick or not, Andrew went with him to Joseph and Catherine's apartment to see what was going on. They had planned to enter through the kitchen door, but as soon as they arrived, they smelled trouble. On the ground, next to the door, in plain sight, lay a panel from the kitchen door, and on top of the panel lay a chisel. The door had likely been opened by an intruder at some point during the night. Using extreme caution, they swung open the door to a silent apartment. Then there was another groan. They cautiously entered through the kitchen and continued down the hall past the bathroom, unknowingly following the same path that the killer had just followed two hours previously. When they arrived at the bedroom, they found a horror scene. Joseph and Catherine were mangled on the bed. They had been killed via a cut to the throat and as if that weren't good enough for whoever had done this, they had also given them a blow to their heads with an axe. Catherine was obviously dead. She had gotten the worst of the attack. 
but somehow Joseph still clung to life. He made an attempt at rising when he saw them enter, but he'd lost too much blood and was unable to complete the task. One of the brothers ran out of the room and fumbled with the phone, calling the police immediately, while the other tried to steady Joseph. But it was of no use. Joseph was dead before the call was made. Corporal Arthur Hatner was the first to arrive on the scene. He saw what had happened and called in for backup while he questioned the brothers as to the events of the evening. He took their statements and then he walked around the apartment looking for evidence. It was at this point that he found two items of note. The first was a pile of bloody men's clothing laying on the bathroom floor. The killer had obviously changed clothes so as not to be caught. It's unclear whether or not he changed into his own clothes or if he took items belonging to Joseph. The second object of note was found nearby in the bathtub. It was Joseph Maggio's axe used to commit the murder. Whoever had done this had hastily tried to wash it in the tub, but there was still some blood clinging to it. The police concluded that the murder had occurred just before dawn. The killer must have broken in through the chiseled out kitchen door and proceeded down the hall to the bedroom. The scenario they had constructed saw him kill Catherine first with the axe and then Joseph immediately following. Then a razor was used on their throats. When the coroner arrived, a crowd of concerned citizens had gathered to watch the events as they unfolded, making it difficult to get in and out as needed. Was it possible that the killer was in this crowd of people, having returned to the scene of the crime? Killers often do. When the coroner had examined the bodies, he corrected the time of death from dawn as the police had thought to several hours before and the bodies were removed from the premises. But as they were leaving, an onlooker stepped forward to give the police information. According to her statement, she had seen Andrew walking around outside in the early morning hours and looking very suspicious. That seemed to give the police a direction to look at least. The brothers were taken into custody for questioning. But then something else happened something that seemed a bit damning at the time. A bloody straight razor was found on the adjoining property. An employee of the barber shop that Andrew owned, Esteban Torres, then stepped forward to give a statement, wherein he told investigators that Andrew had removed that very razor from the shop two days before in order to hone out a nick from the blade. Sure enough, the blade had a nick in it. Jake was released the following day, but Andrew was retained in custody. It seemed that police didn't believe his story that he was too drunk to hear the noise of a break-in when his apartment shared a wall with Joseph and Catherine. They didn't seem bothered that Jake's apartment also shared a wall with the victims and he'd not heard a noise of a break-in either nor were they bothered by the fact that apparently Joseph and Catherine had also not heard the break-in. Neither of them had gotten out of bed to confront the intruder, after all, and that panel would have taken a bit of time to chisel out. But they were now in possession of a murder weapon that belonged to Andrew, and they also had a witness who put him at the scene. The Picayune Times had quite a time with the story, as their coverage of these events was selling their newspapers like hotcakes. They interviewed Andrew after Jake was released, and he stuck to his story, proclaiming his innocence and heartbrokenness about the death of his brother. Sometime during police questioning, Andrew told investigators that he remembered seeing an unknown man enter the Maggio apartment sometime around 1.30 a.m. as he had staggered home drunk. Police did not believe him. 
how could he have been aware enough to have remembered seeing a man entering their apartment, but not aware enough to have heard signs of a break-in? The man that Andrew saw apparently just opened the door and walked in. Of what use was chiseling out a panel in the door? But it also would have made sense that he didn't hear anything if the murder had occurred before he got into his apartment for the night. Nonetheless, nobody believed Andrew. What on earth could have been the motive, though? The safe had been found open and empty with no signs of force, but all of the jewelry and money were still in the apartment, suggesting that robbery was, in fact, not the motivation for this crime. But what was? Did the killer have an animosity towards Catherine? After all, she had received the worst of the attack. Her head had nearly been taken off of her body. Was Joseph attacked simply because he was there? There was no evidence to lend any plausibility to any ideas about a motive. But the ease with which the intruder navigated their home indicated that he was very familiar with the layout of the apartment. He had likely been here before. Two days after his arrest, Andrew was released. The police were unable to find holes in his story even after a brutal line of questioning. But things would get even stranger. About two blocks from the scene of the crime, a handwritten note was found, scribbled into the sidewalk in chalk. It read, Mrs. Maggio will set up tonight, just like Mrs. Tony. It was a cryptic message to be sure, and it involved one of the victims. It also seemed, if it were related at all to the crime, that it would be at least circumstantial evidence that this crime was mainly directed at Catherine. But what did it mean? Who was Mrs. Tony? In 1918, a retired police detective spoke to the newspaper about a slew of axe murders he had worked on in 1911. All of the victims' homes had been broken into in exactly the same way that this murder had occurred. They were all Italian grocers, and the name of one of them was Tony Crudi. Perhaps his wife is the Mrs. Tony of the letter. But that doesn't make any sense. Tony Crudi was unmarried. Perhaps it was a girlfriend. We don't know. But this did lead to speculation that a shadow mafia was at play here, called the Black Hand, who took the lives of those who didn't pay up. We don't know any of this for sure. But we do know that, unfortunately, it wouldn't be long before the axe man would strike again. On Friday morning, June 28th, a local grocer named Louis Bessimer had finished his day's work. He had an apartment at the back of his store, and he and Harriet lay in bed, sleeping soundly. It had been a long day, and sleep came easily to them. They slept so well, in fact, that neither of them heard the distinct sound of a chisel taking out a panel on the back door of the store. And, further, neither of them heard the intruder entering the building. But nonetheless, he carried an axe, and he moved silently. The attack was sudden and unexpected, and the killer left unobserved. Later that morning, a delivery truck came to a halt in front of Louis Bessemer's grocery. John Zenka had arrived as usual with his load of bread for the store. He tried the door, but it was locked. This was unusual. Lewis had always been up and waiting for him by this time. He knocked a few times, but nothing came of it. So he went around to the back door to try again. 
The Bessemers had an apartment in the back of the store, and Zinka thought he had, perhaps, slept in this morning for some reason. When he got to the door, he heard movement inside. Zinka went ahead and knocked on the door then, feeling good that someone was actually there. But he didn't feel good for long. When Louis Bessemer opened the door, Zenka saw a large mass of blood on the floor and gash wounds on his head. Harriet's mangled body lay on the bed, soaked in blood. He noticed a set of bloody footprints leading from the bed to a swatch of false hair. Zenka called the police, much to the protestation of Bessemer, who wanted him to call his private physician first. When an ambulance arrived, both Lewis and Harriet were whisked away to Charity Hospital, and the police examined the crime scene. The first thing they noticed was that entry had been made in exactly the same way as with the Maggio murders. A panel had been chiseled out of the door and now lay on the ground outside, the chisel laid neatly on top of it. The police had a suspicion of what they would find in the bathtub, and the hunch turned out to be correct. It was the murder weapon, a bloody axe belonging to the victim. The press was going to have a field day with this, and the police knew the pressure was on to find the murderer. As they began to question people associated with the couple, they soon found a new suspect in a man who had been working for Bessemer for the past week. A man named Louis Ubicon. In spite of the fact that there was absolutely no evidence to convict this man, the police took him into custody, citing an inconsistency in his alibi for the time of the murders. However, they were forced to release Ubicon after not being able to gather sufficient evidence to charge him with the crime. Media focus would soon shift, however. Louis Bessemer made the mistake of asking the hospital staff to be directed to Mrs. Harriet Lowe, the mistake that would stir up a hornet's nest for him. The hospital staff told him repeatedly that nobody by that name had been checked in. Lewis insisted that she had and that they had come to the hospital together. There was a back and forth for a while before the hospital realized that Harriet was not Bessemer's wife as everyone had previously thought. The assumption had been made that the two were married, and she had been checked in under the name Harriet Bessemer. Upon learning this, the Picayune Times focused in on her, and she loved it. His wife, however, did not. She learned of the other Mrs. Bessemer upon her return from Cincinnati and reading a newspaper. Needless to say, this added to the drama that was already present. But even in her weakened critical state, Harriet Lowe relished the attention. She made up several different descriptions of her attacker before accusing Bessemer himself of attacking her while she was sleeping. Furthermore, weeks later she accused him of being a German spy, and the newspapers printed a story in which letters in Russian, German, and Yiddish were said to have been found in a trunk in his home not something that was taken lightly during World War II. Government officials started looking into him, even as the police were investigating him as the attacker in the ongoing case. But after the truth of her marital status was printed in the Picayune Times, Harriet stopped talking. Bessemer was taken into custody during which time he asked to be assigned to his own case regardless of the fact that he was not even a police officer. Police knew he had something he was trying to hide. It was quite obvious even after a short period of time spent with this man. There was this ridiculous request, of course, and then there was the fact that he had not wanted the police called when the attack occurred. The prevailing theory about what he was hiding was that he and Harriet had been having a heated domestic dispute which got violent, and he had attacked her with an axe. He was quickly charged with the attack and sent to prison. 
Harriet died on August 5, 1918, as a result of the attack. Meanwhile, the killer, who had no doubt been watching from the shadows, had no intention of stopping. For while Louis Bessemer was serving his time in prison for the attacks, the killer struck again on the very same day that Harriet succumbed to her wounds the killer struck another victim and this time he showed how depraved he really was August 5th 1918 it was a Monday night and 28 year old Anna Schneider was sleeping in her home her husband was working late tonight and she had gone to bed alone. Anna was eight months pregnant with their first child, and they were looking forward to being parents. But tonight, something wicked would enter their lives. Anna had settled into a sound sleep on their bed, when for some reason, possibly a light sound, she awoke. What she saw sent a fright through her. There, in front of the bed, stood a dark figure in shadow. Anna screamed. <coughs> and the figure attacked her face with an axe before leaving. Sometime around midnight, her husband, Edward Schneider, returned home. his wife did not greet him at the door as she normally did. In fact, no sound at all came from the house. Immediately he was on guard. He went up the stairs to see if she had gone to bed and discovered, to his horror, that his wife had been attacked. He immediately called an ambulance and they whisked her away to the hospital where she was treated for her wounds and delivered a healthy baby girl two days after the attack. The police covered the crime scene looking for clues. None of the doors or windows looked as though they had been forced. Robbery seemed to be out as a motive, even though seven dollars was reportedly stolen from Edward's wallet. The police began to suspect that all of these attacks had been perpetrated by the same person, This came as no surprise to Louis Bessemer, who was still sitting in prison for the last attack. There were conflicting reports as to whether the attack was made with an axe or a lamp, but whatever was used, it was brutal. The Picayune Times picked up on this and ran with the story. Is the axe man at large in New Orleans was the headline they chose. Fear spread like wildfire, and everyone in the city walked around in an anxious state, thinking that they were seeing the axe man at every turn, even though no one knew what he looked like. Chisels were found outside of doors, and people reported hearing scratching at their doors. Several people claimed to have chased shadowy figures away from their property during the night. The police, with the press breathing down their neck, found themselves in falling favor with the public. Eventually, a man named James Gleason was arrested for running from the police and interrogated for the attack on Anna. But he was released two days later due to lack of evidence. He had run because he'd had several run-ins with the law and got scared. The police continued in their speculation that all of these murders were connected. All of them had been committed with an axe that was left in the bathroom. All of them had made use of a panel which had been chiseled out of the door to provide entry. However, there was no usable evidence left behind at any of the scenes. But as more and more chisels were found outside of doors and scratching heard at doors, the police also wondered if the press release had created a mob of copycats and pranksters. After all, whoever did this would have to be working overtime to be in all of these places at once. 
you wouldn't expect a killer to have that kind of work ethic. Five days after Anna Schneider was attacked, the killer struck again. This time the victim was the elderly Joseph Romano, who lived with his two nieces, Pauline and Mary. At some point during the evening, the women were awakened by several loud thumping noises that seemed as though they were coming from their uncle's room in their house. Thinking that something might have happened to their uncle, the girls got up and hurried to his room. But as they approached his room, they saw the intruder as he was fleeing the scene. Their hearts jumped into their throats, but they didn't have time to confront him as their uncle was lying in a pool of blood on his bed and needed immediate medical attention. The sisters hurriedly called for an ambulance. When the police got there, they found the usual signs of the axe man, a chiseled door panel and a bloody axe in the backyard. But this time, the girls were able to give a vague description. They said he was a dark-skinned, heavy-set man who wore a dark suit and a slouched hat. As newsworthy as it was that somebody was able to give any description at all of this mysterious person, it was, in the end, not very helpful. Everyone wore a suit in those days, and he for sure had more than one. If he changed clothes, then most of their description of the perpetrator would be gone. Joseph's room was ransacked, but as far as anyone could tell, nothing had been taken. Which raises the question, what had the killer been looking for in all of these attacks, if not money and valuables? Many of the scenes had been ransacked frantically. What was the purpose? It seems like he would have been at more risk of being caught by making all of that noise and taking the time to go through a person's belongings for no reason. Or was he simply making a mess because he liked messes? Perhaps he was trying to disrespect a victim's property before taking their lives in some display of power. The answer to these questions was not forthcoming, but fear that spread like wildfire among the residents of New Orleans was, some of whom were probably unknowingly expressing their fears to the Axeman himself in whatever interactions he made with other people during the day. Chisels and axes continued to be found outside of doors and in people's yards. One man, in particular, seemed to have narrowly missed being the next victim, as he opened his door one day to find a chisel laying on the ground and signs on the door of having been chipped, but no sign of the axe man. Questioning people became difficult for police as they knew that the residents of New Orleans were storytellers by their nature. And it was not easy sometimes to distinguish fantasy from reality during those interactions. Was the rise in reports simply pranksters? Or were they actually intended victims of the real Axeman? Was this the work of the legendary Black Hand? Did the Black Hand even exist? It was at this point that retired detective Joseph D'Antanio began speaking about a set of murders which had occurred seven years previous to these events, which followed the same M.O. and the killer was never caught. Was this killer and the Axeman one and the same? The statements made by D'Antonio did nothing to put out the fires of public hysteria and the lack of a good description of the axe man didn't help matters. It's very difficult to put out an APB on a dark, shadowy figure. Did the perpetrator behind the earlier crimes simply take a break and then come back again for more? Several months after the Schneider attack, Screams were heard coming from the Cordomiglia house on Jefferson and 2nd Street in a suburb of New Orleans called Gretna. 
Rolando Giordando lived across the street and heard the screams. He took off across the street to see what was going on. When he arrived at the house, he found that the entire family had been attacked by the Axeman, and it looked like Orlando just missed him. The most heartbreaking thing of all, however, was that he had murdered Mary, their two-year-old girl, first. Orlando called an ambulance and the family was taken to Charity Hospital. When police arrived, they found what they were expecting at the scene, a chisel and an axe. It looked as though the killer had stacked some wood next to the fence for ease of escape this time. Apparently, he had been either staking out houses or was otherwise familiar with them. This was not the first time this observation had been made, as with the Maggio murders he seemed to know the layout of the house before he got there. When Rosie was in a condition to speak with police, she pointed her finger at Orlando and his son Frank. She swore that they, and they alone, had been the ones who attacked the family. Her husband, Charlie, heavily disputed that claim, but she stuck to it nonetheless. This, plus the suffered tragedy in their lives, caused so much tension in their marriage that he eventually left her. In the courtroom, as Frank and Orlando appeared as the defense, it became confusing how these two could have been guilty of anything like what they had been accused of. Orlando himself was 69 years old and suffering health problems. Frank, his son, was 330 pounds and could not have fit through the small panel cut out in the door. It's difficult to see how anyone could have fit through the tiny panel, let alone such a large man. There were three pieces of what could loosely be called evidence that stood against the two. The first was the fact that Orlando was a rival grocer. He and Charlie had been in competition for some time now. The second was that he had made a comment to the coroner's jury a few days prior about having had a premonition that something bad was going to happen to Charles. And the third was the testimony of Rosie herself. Her testimony was so emotional, moving, and convincing that these two men were quickly convicted of the slayings. Frank was sentenced to hang, and Orlando was to spend the rest of his life in prison. But Rosie had also once accused her own husband of the crime. Was her word to be believed? Maybe, but maybe not. In March of 1919, the Picayune Times newspaper received a letter which it then reprinted in its newspaper. The letter reads as follows. From Hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me, and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible even as the ether that surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a fell demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come again and claim other victims. I alone know who they shall be. I shall leave no clue except my bloody axe, be smeared with the blood and brains of him whom I have sent below to keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police not to rile me. Of course I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigation in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as to amuse not only me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the Axeman. I don't think there is any need for such a warning 
for I feel sure that the police will always dodge me, as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you Orleanians think of me as a most horrible murderer, which I am. But I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship to the Angel of Death. Now, to be exact, at 12.15 earthly time, on next Tuesday night, I am going to visit New Orleans again. In my infinite mercy, I am going to make a proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in the nether regions that every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well, then, so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of these people who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartarus, and as it is about time that I leave your earthly home, I will cease my discourse. Hoping that thou wilt publish this, and that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed in fact or realm of fantasy. Signed, The Axeman. Whether or not this letter was written by the actual New Orleans Axeman, we don't know. However, given the escalation of violence and depravity he had exhibited during these crimes, it could believably have been the same person. Whether it was or not, the people of New Orleans took it very seriously. Jazz bands made a lot of money that night as every house in town was scrambling to hire them to be playing at exactly 12.15 for the Axeman's pleasure. Presumably, the Axeman went through the town that night looking for houses that were not playing jazz. Or he could have possibly gone to sleep and felt powerful, knowing that all of the citizens of New Orleans were watching empty streets in fear and jumping at shadows hoping he didn't show up. In any case, nobody was killed that night. But the attacks continued. On August 10th, 1919, the next attack occurred. Steve Boca, a local grocer, had been attacked while sleeping. He managed to stumble to a friend's house to get help, but he had no memory of the event to share with local police. The same chisel and axe were found at the scene. September 3rd, 1919 19-year-old Sarah Lohman was found in her bed with multiple wounds to her head. There was no sign of forced entry into the home. Investigators found a bloody axe outside of her window. October 27, 1919. Mrs. Pepitone and her husband had separate bedrooms. One night she awoke to hear what sounded like a struggle coming from Mike's room. She got up and went to check it out, and would have come face to face with the killer leaving the room had he been facing in her direction as he left. He did not attack her, but instead made a quick escape while she went to check on her husband. Their daughter went to get the police while Mike's wife saw to him. When the police arrived, they found her calmly standing over his body and looking at him. It looks like the axe man was here and murdered Mike, she said, almost entirely without emotion. Mike died at the hospital shortly after that. 
the attacker was overly confident. There were eight people in the house, and he wasn't concerned with being seen, heard, or identified by any of them. When the police questioned Mrs. Pepitone, she told them that she had seen two intruders in the house rather than the one that had been reported in other cases. They had been heavy men, according to her testimony. Mrs. Pepitone didn't seem to be distraught or upset in any way over the attack of her husband. Needless to say, this came across as very suspicious to police. She was under some suspicion for a time, but eventually cleared. She didn't have the motive or the strength to commit the murders, and there was no evidence that she'd hired another person to do it. Several people began to speculate about the entry into the houses. In both descriptions from people who had caught glimpses of the axe man, they had described someone who was very tall and heavy set, but the panels that had been cut out of the doors were very short and narrow. It's hard to imagine that anyone, let alone a heavy set man, could squeeze through the opening it provided. There was some speculation that the panels were not used for entrance, but rather that they were simply an opening which one could use to put their arm through and unlock the door from the inside. This, however, didn't seem to be the case either, as the door locks were too far away from the hole to be able to reach them. Was the axeman correct in his assertion that he was not human after all? There were six victims of his attacks in 1918, and six victims in 1919, and six of them were murders. Six, 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 the number of the beast. Regardless of who or what he was, this was the last murder. The Axeman has not been seen or heard from in over a hundred years. One final note on the account of the New Orleans Axeman. On December 2nd, 1920, a man named Joseph Mumphrey was walking by himself down a street at night. As he passed by a darkened doorway, somebody dressed entirely in black stepped out of the shadows with a pistol and shot him. <laughs> Mumphrey fell onto the ground, dead. The shadowy figure sat down on the concrete and waited for police to arrive. When the police cars came up to the scene where the dead man was laying, they recognized the shadowy figure. It was Mrs. Pepitone. She insisted with 100% certainty that Mumphrey had been the man she had seen running from her home the night her husband was killed. She cooperated fully with the authorities during her arrest. Was she correct? After all, Mumphrey did have a nasty criminal record from 1911 to 1918 when the murders began. He had done a stint in prison from the time of the last murder in 1918 until the time of the first murder in 1919, which left him free to have committed all of the attacks. It would also explain the large gap in time in the murder spree. But the testimony of Mrs. Pepitone was all the evidence that existed. There wasn't a shred of evidence to link him to any of these crimes. A criminal such as Mumphrey would likely have taken the cash and valuables that were left in plain sight as well. Besides about ten dollars in the Anna Schneider case, nothing of value was ever taken. The motive for these crimes is up for debate, of course. But the killer did ransack the rooms, which indicates that he was looking for something. Who knows what, though? In December of 1920, Mrs. Cordomiglia contracted smallpox. She claimed that she was visited by an angel who told her to tell the truth and recanted her testimony against Orlando and Frank Giordando. They were released, since the Cordomiglia testimony was the only evidence that existed against them. She did not know who had attacked her. 
Mrs. Pepitone was sentenced to 10 years in a Los Angeles prison for the murder of Joseph Mumphrey, served three of them, and promptly disappeared into the crowd, never to be seen again. Louis Bessemer was acquitted of the murder of Harriet Lowe in April of 1919 due to lack of evidence. The Axeman was never identified. He would certainly be dead now, as over a hundred years have passed since his murder spree. Likely, whoever he was, he was living among us as a normal person. You probably wouldn't have looked twice at him on any given day. But if you did talk to him, it is likely that you would have thought him a polite, kind-hearted, and well-spoken man. Likely, he was buried and mourned by people he was close to. Kind-hearted eulogies were probably given, and many tears were likely shed for him. Whoever filled that coffin, he shared it with his secret. <laughs>